Beginning in verse 1, this is the word of the Lord. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. He did right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David and did not turn aside to the right or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still youth, he began to seek the God of his father David. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the Asherim, the carved images and the molten images. They tore down the altars of the Baals in his presence and the incense altars that were high above them he chopped down. Also the Asherim, the carved images, the molten images, he broke in pieces and ground to powder and scattered it on the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. Then he burned the bones of the priests on their altars and purged Judah and Jerusalem. In the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, Simeon, even as far as Naphtali and their surrounding ruins, he also tore down the altars and beat the Asherim and the carved images into powder and chopped down all the incense altars throughout the land of Israel. Then he returned to Jerusalem. Now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house, he sent Saphron, the son of Azaliah, and Maaseah, an official in the city, and Joah, the son of Johaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. They came to Hilkiah, the high priest, and delivered the money that was brought into the house of God, which the Levites, the doorkeepers, had collected from Manasseh and Ephraim, and from all the remnant of Israel, and from all Judah and Benjamin, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Then they gave it into the hands of the workmen who had the oversight of the house of the Lord, and the workmen who were working in the house of the Lord used it to restore and repair the house." They in turn gave it to the carpenters and to the builders to buy quarried stone and timber for couplings and to make beams for the houses which the kings of Judah had let go to ruin. The men did the work faithfully with foremen over them to supervise. Jahath and, and Obadiah, the Levites of the sons of Merari, Zechariah and Meshulam of the sons of the Kohathites, and the Levites, all who were skillful with musical instruments. They were also over the burden bearers and supervised all the workmen from job to job, and some of the Levites were scribes and officials and gatekeepers. When they were bringing out the money which had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Hilkiah responded and said to Shaphan, the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. Then Shaphan brought the book to the king and reported further word to the king, saying, Everything that was entrusted to your servants they are doing. They have also emptied out the money which was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hands of the supervisors and the workmen. Moreover, Shaphan, the scribe, told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest gave me a book. And Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah, Achaim, the son of Shaphan, Abdan, the son of Micah, Shaphan, the scribe, and Uzziah, the king's servant, saying, Go, Inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book which has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord which is poured out on us because our fathers have not observed the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. So Hilkiah and those whom the king had told went to Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tuk. Okhath, the son of Harash, the keeper of the wardrobe. Now she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they spoke to her regarding this. She said to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, tell the man who sent me to you, excuse me, sent you to me, thus says the Lord, behold, I am bringing evil on this place and on its inhabitants, even all the curses written in the book, which they have read in the presence of the king of Judah. Because they have forsaken me and have burned incense to other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be poured out on this place and it shall not be quenched. 
But to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus you will say to him, Thus says the Lord God of Israel regarding the words which you have heard. Because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and against his inhabitants. And because you humbled yourself before me, tore your clothes and have wept before me, I truly have heard you, declares the Lord. Behold, I will gather you to your fathers and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. So your eyes will not see all the evil which I bring on this place and on its inhabitants. And they brought back word to the king. Then the king sent and gathered all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. The king went up to the house of the Lord and all the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests, the Levites, and all the people from the greatest to the least. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. Then the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord. And to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of the covenant written in this book. Moreover, he made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to stand with him. So the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. Josiah removed all the abominations from all the lands belonging to the sons of Israel and made all who were present in Israel to serve the Lord their God. Throughout his lifetime, they did not turn from following the Lord God of their fathers. Well, before I get into the message, I want to say just a couple things. Uh, One, I know he's not here to hear it right now, but thanks to Pastor Tyler for the opportunities of uh, preaching during this month. In, uh, in his absence. And for those of you who might be visiting for the first time or you've been coming all through June, I do want to assure you Pastor Tyler is real and he will be back next week. And I know you're looking forward to it and I'm looking forward to it probably more than you are actually. I'm just greatly excited about him uh, being back here in the pulpit once again. Um, also, just want to mention as well with this, if you've been here through this, this time, uh, through June in these four sermons, I hope that you walk away with uh, a desire for, or a greater desire and hunger for revival, and that the Lord uses what we see in Scripture uh, to be able to ignite this fire, if you will, in your heart and life. And that the stories that I tell you from uh, the history of, in our nation and some from around the world as well of revivals that have taken place in the last couple centuries or so, that just some of these things will ignite a spark in your heart. I know the uh, first time when I really heard more of these and read about more of these, it uh, did that very thing in mine as well. Well, with that in mind, I want to tell you about a new person today. Well, he's not new, but he might be new uh, to you. In fact, so let me ask you right at the outset, how many of you are familiar with the name Asahel Nettleton? Let's see hands. Okay, I had two in the first service, so we're close. Uh, I didn't know about him either until about, uh, I guess, a little over 20, 25 years ago, something like that. through times in Bible college and seminary, never heard of him. It wasn't until later. So let me tell you just a little bit about him. He was born in 1783 in New England. By the year 1830, he was considered to be the leading evangelist in the East. He is obviously little known today, but he was one of the greatest leaders of revival in the 1800s. It is estimated that he was used of the Lord to lead somewhere around 30,000 people to come to know Christ. So who was he? He was a modest man. He refused to claim any superior talents or take credit for what was taking place under his ministry. He was said to be just an average scholar, extremely modest, even given to times of depression. If people praised him or his ministry excessively, or if there was evidence of too much confidence in him, he would occasionally just disappear from the public eye. His biographer from the time, Bennett Tyler, was asked about Nettleton's success, and Tyler wrote these words. 
we must not overlook the fact God acts as a sovereign and pours out his spirit when, where, and in what measure he pleases. Nettleton knew that he was an earthen vessel and that when any success attended his labors, the excellency was of the power of God and not of him. Unquote. Nettleton had a powerful ministry, but he was a very humble man. And God used him to spread the fires of revival with this great humility all around through New England especially. So let's go back about 2,500 years before that, though, before Nettleton's day to the day of Hezekiah, king of Judah. We talked about him a couple of weeks ago, but uh, maybe just barely mentioned this at the end. Near the end of his reign, he became proud for a time. He had led the nation in a time of great revival, but near the end, he became, he became a bit proud for a while. Fortunately, though, he recognized his sin and chose to repent. After he died, the next two kings of Judah, his son Manasseh and then his son Ammon, neither one sought the Lord. They both were evil kings. They brought, both brought great <clears throat> evil and idolatry into the nation. They had no desire to see revival come, and under their reigns, the nation teetered on the brink of disaster. The latter part of Hezekiah's reign saw this spiritual decline begin, if you will, just starting down. But by the time of his son Manasseh, it came full-blown at that point. Manasseh reigned for 55 years. He was an extremely wicked king. If you read about him, you can read some in chapter 33. In fact, I'm going to touch on some of it in just, just a couple of minutes here. Uh, near the end of his life, though, <clears throat> there was a brief spark that was positive. He had been taken captive by the Assyrians. And while he was in captivity, he finally came to the recognition that he needed to return to the Lord. He humbled himself, as it tells us in the text. And you can look in chapter 33 with me if you have your Bible open. In verse 12, it says, When he was in distress, he entreated the favor of the Lord his God <clears throat> and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. He prayed to him, and God was moved by his entreaty and heard his plea and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. So fortunately, he humbled himself. He returned to the Lord near the end of his life, but as we read on, it had little to no impact on the nation of Judah as a whole. When Manasseh died, his son Ammon came to the throne, and he reigned only briefly. He was extremely wicked, just as wicked or more so than his father, if you will. He refused to humble himself before the Lord. And after reigning only two years, he was assassinated by his servants. Look down to verse 22. You can see where it <clears throat> mentions that in chapter 33. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord as Manasseh, his father, had done. Ammon sacrificed to all the images that Manasseh, his father, had made and served them. And he did not humble himself before the Lord as Manasseh, his father, had humbled himself. But this Ammon incurred guilt more and more. That's where the nation was at that point. He died. He was assassinated. His son, Josiah, was eight years old. The year was 642 B.C., but being son of the king, he was crowned to be the next king. The nation desperately needed another revival. It had been around 75 years at this point since, since the last revival under Hezekiah earlier in his reign. It was time for God's people to humble themselves and return to him. Do we need to be humbled before the Lord? It's too easy when times are good, especially to be just kind of full of ourselves. Maybe a bit, or maybe a lot, self-reliant. I can take care of things. I'm fine. Everything's good. If things get really bad, I'll, I'll you know, I know I need the Lord then, but I'm, I'm good right now. It's too easy to rely upon ourselves instead of him. If revival will come to God's people, God's people must humble themselves before him. So even just in the stillness, if you, if you will, of this moment, Will you talk to the Lord right where you are and ask him if there's a need there to humble your heart before him? 
and ask him to humble our church before him. So what is humility? Humility is a modesty that rejects pride and arrogance. It sees that all that we have comes from the hand of God himself. Our appearance, our education, our gifts, our jobs, our ministries, the very breath that we breathe, everything comes from him. We have no reason to exalt ourselves or try to make ourselves look better than someone else. Humility desires to turn to God with a repentant heart. Romans 12 and verse 3 says, Do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought. Do we need revival? If so, then we must humbly seek revival from the hand of the Lord. So, How do we recognize humility? If we're going to have this kind of humility that really seeks the Lord and seeks revival, what does this humility look like? So I want to show you a few different things this morning uh, I think that we'll be able to see from the text here. First thing is this. True humility understands the tendency for people to fall away from the Lord. Let me say it again. It's, It's a long sentence. True humility understands the tendency for people to fall away from the Lord. It is so easy for people, including Christians, to believe, that again, that we're doing fine, that we can make it on our own. We can even think as believers, you know, I'm really strong in the Lord. I've become a really strong believer along the way. And, you know, other people, I understand their problems, but I'm doing great. Things are okay. I wonder if the people of Josiah's day may have felt that way. We're the people of God. We're of the chosen nation. You see, great revival had occurred early in the reign of Hezekiah, and I'm sure some of this had been talked about, had been mentioned along the way, had been passed down, at least in stories. Hezekiah and his people had come together to to worship the Lord in large numbers. They committed themselves to the Lord. There was joy and singing and praise that was powerful. The nations around were impacted greatly by what was going on in the nation of Judah. But this revival under Hezekiah came to an end. So let me state this, and I'll state it two or three different ways. Great times of revival, sooner or later, all end. And I'm not saying by that 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 means that after a time of revival that everybody must slide and and go way away from the Lord so that they can come back again. Sometimes that happens. It doesn't need to. A time of revival can be this great time of God working, and then God's people continue to move on in powerful ways, just in normal, if you will, normal Christian life. No one in no church has ever lived in a constant state of revival. Revival ought to lead God's people to become more consistent in the normal times in their walk with Christ. Great revivals often have long-lasting impact on the churches and the communities and the culture around. Many of the organizations that are social organizations in our country that we have that you say, well, they, they may be kind of Christian but not really strong. They were almost all, without exception, started after times of revival when God's people says we've got to impact the whole culture. You can do a study on that. But sin crept back in to Judah after Hezekiah's time. In fact, during the end of Hezekiah's time it began. Let me just highlight a couple more things in chapter 33 and then we'll let it go here in just a minute. Look at Manasseh's time, just a little bit of it. Verse 2, chapter 33 He, Manasseh, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. He rebuilt the high places that his father Hezekiah had broken down. And it goes on to talk about how he erected altars all over Jerusalem and all over the nation to worship all of these other false gods, all of the gods of the nations. Even welcoming in, down in verse 6, sorcery and mediums and necromancers. Everything he possibly could do to provoke the Lord God. 
As I mentioned, his son did no better, and we saw some of the verses there at the end of the chapter in 22 and 23 about Ammon's time. Sin has a way of creeping in to our lives, doesn't it? You ever struggle with the pressures of this world? The attacks of Satan, the sinfulness of your own heart? We somehow, even as believers at times, because of whatever, the pressures of the world or just what's within our, within our own lives, look out and see, man, the grass seems greener out there. Let's try it. Do you find sin creeping back into your life? Even now, you stop and think, you know, in recent days, maybe for some who say, you know, it's, something pretty big's come into my life. Maybe for others it's saying, yeah, but nobody really worries about these kinds of sins anymore. These are more acceptable. They're not so bad. Some lessons from this that I want to mention. First one is this. We all have a tendency to sin, to wander away from the Lord. Those words from the great hymn, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Listen, if, you're, if you believe that you're incapable of falling into sin, then I can assure you have, you have a heart of pride, not one of humility. If you look down on others who are sinners and say to yourself, I can never do what they do, then you have a heart of pride, not a heart of humility. People quick, quickly forget the Lord and the need to remain close to Him. It becomes easy to take for granted the good things that are going on, the good things that He's done in the past. When times are good, it's easy to forget about how dependent we really are on the Lord for everything. Are we living in one of those times? I mean, us Forest Baptists, do we live in one of those times? Sin's power is enormous. I want to refer just to a couple of verses. You don't have to turn there, but in Romans 3, I look at the words of the Apostle Paul here, in the beginning of verse 10, he says, As it's written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. He goes on to, down to verse 18, says, There's no fear of God before their eyes. Sin's power is enormous. It's too easy to fail to recognize how awful it is. Sin can easily enter the church. Idolatry, apathy, indifference, prayerlessness, self-reliance, unbelief, lack of desire for the Lord and for his word, sins of the tongue, pride and unloving spirit, bitterness, unforgiving heart, on and on and on. There's one more thing that I want to share in the way of just of a lesson from this first point. No revival lasts forever. This is not just in Bible times, but it's in more current times, if you will. The Great Awakening of the 1730s, 1740s. It was a great awakening in this country, but it ended. So did the Second Great Awakening in the early 1800s. Another revival came in 1904, started in Wales. I told you about that uh, about was it two, three weeks ago or so, spread around the world, but it also came to an end. Other revivals since, in the times of Billy Graham, the times of the Jesus movement in the 1960s and 70s, other revivals we still hear of today that spring up in places and, and maybe in a certain area, or uh, they become very powerful, but they all eventually end. True humility understands the tendency of people to fall away from the Lord. I must understand that I can easily fall away from him. And I do. Do you see how even you and our, even our church can fall away, save for the grace of God? 
Humility understands that we are weak and can easily fall, but it understands that God is great. And so our estimation needs to rise concerning him while understanding that we are weak and small and how desperately we need him. True humility understands the tendency of people to fall away. True humility also listens to those who call people to return to God. A humble person doesn't have all the answers. A humble person is ready to listen. A humble person wants to know what is true and desires to listen when he hears someone call people back to the Lord. The Lord raises up certain people throughout time, and we're going to see today it was Josiah that he raised up. Josiah was God's man in his day. He was king of Judah, but even more as a leader and as a man, he was humble before the Lord. Look at chapter 34. I just want to read over a verse or two again. Verse 2, he says, He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He walked in the ways of David his father, and he did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Man, right from the get-go, as a boy, as an eight-year-old, he was committed to the Lord. He wanted to follow the Lord. You read on down into verse 3, and it says, In the eighth year of his reign, that's when he was 16, he began to seek the God of David, his father. This is when his spiritual journey really took off. I mean, before this, he wanted to follow the Lord, but now he's seeking the Lord. We talked about that a few weeks ago, what that means and how that's so vital in times of revival and such a big word here in 2 Chronicles. He was 16 years old. He saw the need to repent. He saw the need to turn away from sin. He saw the need to fully commit himself to the Lord as a 16-year-old teenager. Listen, we must never underestimate our teenagers and how God can have his hand on them and how they can be serious about the Lord. Well, I hope you see our teenagers that way. I thank the Lord that my home church, when I was a teenager, saw teenagers like that, how they took me seriously. Our youth group, uh, part of our youth group now has, has gone to Puerto Rico. It was almost this time of year. It was sometime in July, I know, when our youth group, I won't tell you what year it was, but went to Jamaica for a missions trip. And some would say it wasn't because I didn't sing well, so I couldn't get with the group that was singing, but I wanted to go. So my youth pastor signed me up to preach. He knew God had called me to serve. I was 17 years old on this trip. Uh, Preached, I know, once in Georgia. I can't remember if I did in Florida as we drove on down. Two or three times in Jamaica. 17 years old. I had people then in the church that looked out and said, you know, here's a young guy. Boy, he's a young guy, but God has his hand, and we're just going to encourage him. We better be doing that with our teenagers and our children in this church as well. Encourage them to serve the Lord. Josiah refused to tolerate sin. Uh, Jared read through the verses beginning in verse 3 and on down through verse 7 of how when he was 20 years old, just a few years later, he began to systematically destroy idolatry in the land. I mean, I think he probably started in Jerusalem and just moved systematically all throughout Judah, everywhere he could go, anywhere where there was an idol to a false god, he had it torn down and destroyed. No longer would that kind of worship be allowed in the land. At the age of 26, he restored worship of the Lord to Israel. See that in verse 8. He began to repair the temple. The temple had fallen into two things, disuse, but also being used to worship false gods. And so Josiah says, that's got to end. This temple is built for the worship of the true God and him alone. So he sent men to get the temple cleaned out. All was going well. The process was good. And then Hilkiah the priest found in the temple the book of the law, which had been lost. Basically, probably what we would call Deuteronomy. Now, Josiah already knew some of what the word of God said because it was passed down orally that people would just continue to say these things. But he didn't even have a copy. He didn't have the copy of the word of the Lord. 
And now it was found. And when it was read to him, he tore his robes in repentance and recognition of his sin and the sin of the nation and chose to respond to the word of God in obedience. He was king, but he was even more. He was a leader with a humble heart. Huldah the prophetess told Hilkiah the priest to go speak with Josiah, and we find the words that he was to share in verse 26. She said, but to the king of Judah who sent you to inquire the Lord, thus shall you, Hilkiah, say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard. Because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and its inhabitants, and you have humbled yourself before me and have torn your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Josiah kept on seeking the Lord, inquiring of the Lord, Depending on how your translation goes, it's the same word in the originals to seek, to inquire. Same thing is going on here and what he's trying to say. He started doing it as a teenager. He didn't quit as an adult. He kept on seeking the Lord. He kept on going and, and talking to the Lord, seeking the Lord in his word. What do you have for me? What are you telling us to do? Yes, Lord, I'll obey. So we learn from this that those who hear the word must listen with humble hearts. We must listen to those who call us back to the Lord. The people listened to the words of Josiah. He called the people to make a covenant with the Lord, and we'll see a little bit more about that, but that's exactly what the people chose to do. Let me mention Asahel Nettleton again. This is a story from really the start of his life with the Lord. He was a man who humbly listened to and responded to God's word. It was the pattern of his life from the time that he was saved. His biographer wrote of him at the time of his salvation these words. Formerly, he had seen himself as merely a lost soul. Now he discovered that he was a rebel against God, totally depraved. The glaring light of gospel truth exposed all his former religious activities as merely the cleansing of the outside of the cup. His self-induced reformation was only an attempt to establish his own righteousness by the works of the law. The reason that God had not heard his prayers was that he had not sought salvation by God's grace through the blood of Christ. He had been, in short, nothing but a self-righteous Pharisee who prided himself on his religious devotions and thought God was under obligation to him. Unquote. Until he humbled himself, Nettleton couldn't be saved. But he humbled himself as he listened to and responded to the preaching of God's word. That marked his life from then on, as it marked the life of Josiah. Admonition to all of us is this, listen to those who preach and teach the word to you. Those who do have a great responsibility to properly handle God's word. Please pray for us that we always do. We never misuse, never use the word wrongly or misinterpret what's there. But you also have a great responsibility to listen carefully and to respond to what you hear. Rather than sorting through, and maybe sometimes we don't fully grasp, but as we hear the word of God, the reply to him should always be, yes, Lord. Whatever you say, I'm there. True humility loves God's word. Just connecting to the last thing we said. See, the word of God is indispensable. Just as oxy oxygen is necessary for life, and food and water are necessary for life, the word of God is necessary for life. God's word provides direction and hope. If you look there in chapter 34, verse 14 and 15, while they were bringing out the money that had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given through Moses. Then Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the secretary, I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. So the book of the law had been lost, 
people knew a little bit about what the Lord required. Josiah was bringing this back to them, but he didn't even have the full story by any means until the book was found. When the book was found, they realized how desperately they needed it, how long it had been lost. Isn't it great to have the Word of God? I remember back years ago, people would say, if you have your Bible, hold it up. And it's like, okay, now we'd see phones with lights all over the place going, which is, which is okay, but I don't need to be blinded. So, uh, My guess is everybody in here has at least one copy of the Word, and if you don't, you know you can get one easily, right? This is, maybe this is embarrassing, I, I don't know, whatever. Um, I was looking the other day on the shelf in my office where I keep different Bibles. I keep two or three on the desk, but it's, it's too cluttered right now already. Anyway, but I looked up on the shelf where I, where I keep them. I have something like 25 in my office, different translations or whatever, you know. Probably three or four or five more at home. It's kind of ridiculous, maybe. I don't know. I think about them, and for a time, they didn't have the Word of God at all. It was lost. I hope you don't take your Bible for granted. Closed Bible does no good. Let's be sure we're in the Word. Let's be sure that when the Word is taught in your classes, hopefully you're in a Sunday school class, when it's preached here in church, that you listen carefully, that you ask God to help you to listen and respond. We must all understand and believe that the Word of God is indispensable for our lives. It provides direction. It provides hope. It changes lives. We saw here how how when the word was given, it pointed out the sin and disobedience of the people down in verses 19 through 21. You see, Josiah heard the word read to him. He immediately recognized the sins of his fathers and his people. He tore his clothes as, as an admission of sin, believing that the wrath of God was what they deserved. Prophetess Huldah made it clear to Hilkiah the priest and those with him that God's judgment would fall harshly on Judah and nothing could stop it. Sin and rejection of God's word always comes with a price. Sin ruins lives now and it ruins lives for all eternity. So what can be done? Word of God changes lives because it points out sin and disobedience, but it it also shows grace and mercy to the one who humbles himself. Remember reading just a few moments ago about uh, what happened with uh, Huldah sending word through Hilkiah down to Josiah. It says, because you've humbled yourself before the Lord, he will be gracious to you. Have you humbled yourself before the Lord in his word? Maybe we can ask the question this way. When you read the word, do you attempt to make it fit into your plan? That's not how it works. If we're doing that, then we've got it backwards. Or do you just kind of ignore parts of it? It's like, nah, it's just not relevant for me. I don't care about that part. Careful. We must humbly ask the Lord to Help us understand and obey the word. So no matter who you are or what you've done, the Spirit of God can take the word of God and change your life in ways that you never could do on your own. I assure you of that. He is really good at it and loves to show grace and mercy to those who humble themselves before him. God's word brings revival It it did in that day, in Josiah's day, and I'll refer to it a couple more times along the way. The word of God was found and read. King Josiah then gathered all of the elders from Judah and Jerusalem, as as well as all the people of Judah and Jerusalem and the priests and the Levites. In other words, he just gathered everybody together, and he had the book of the law read to all of the people. Asahel Nettleton tells about in his day 
or it's told about in his day, about his belief in the power of the Word of God to bring revival. He believed that when he preached the Word of God that God was going to do great things. He preached about God's sovereignty and holiness. He preached about the depravity of man, the reality of heaven and hell, that regeneration comes through the blood of Christ. During his days, preachers and laymen alike preached the word in season and out, out of season, hoping that God would, and I quote, rend the heavens and come down. Nettleton believed that spiritual awakenings were miracles sent by God. One more thing about this humility I want us to see as we approach the end. True humility desires a right relationship with the Lord. It's more than just a list of doing things right and not doing things that are wrong, but it's a relationship. Look down to verse 31 in chapter 34. It says, The king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in this book. Josiah fully committed himself to the Lord. He heard the word of the Lord. You know in Scripture how many times you'll read about covenants and it is God making a covenant or developing this special relationship with his people. Here is Josiah making this covenant, which involved a commitment. It involved relationship, a permanent sort of relationship that he was making with the Lord, saying that I will follow you. I will be committed to you. You will be first in my life. Josiah cared about having that kind of walk with God. The people along with him fully committed themselves to the Lord. Look at the next verse there, verse 33. Josiah took away all the abominations from all the territory. Uh, hang on, back up to verse 32. Then he made all who were present in Jerusalem and in Benjamin join in it. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. Josiah's influence as a leader, as a humble leader, was powerful. He impressed upon the people their need to make the same kind of covenant commitment in relationship with the Lord. And what happened? They agreed. They said, we'll do it too. God's people should always desire to walk in a right relationship with him. Again, when we hear God's word, our answer ought to be, yes, Lord, whatever you say. just want to keep walking with you. Sometimes the word impacts one person at a time. Sometimes it impacts large numbers of people. One more story about Nettleton. The place was Saratoga Springs, New York. The year was 1817. Asahel Nettleton was preaching there. An observer recalled the scene as, a quote, beyond description. The place was so full that many could not fit in the building. And he said, and I quote again, Did you ever witness 200 sinners with one accord in one place, weeping for their sins? I felt as though I was standing on the verge of the eternal world, while the floor under my feet was shaken by the trembling of anxious souls in view of a judgment to come. Unquote. When many people agree together to turn to the Lord or return to the Lord, it can only be said that God did a great work. The Lord was at work in this relationship, in this covenant, this commitment that was made. Back to verse 33 that I started earlier, Josiah took away all the abominations from all the territory that belonged to the people of Israel and made all who were present in Israel serve the Lord their God. All his days they did not turn away from following the Lord, the God of their fathers. Look what God did. Look what God did. He used Josiah to rid the nation of sin and idolatry. The people served the Lord along with their king for the whole reign of King Josiah. And if you would read on over into chapter 35, 
the nation, and this is part of the result of the revival that took place among the people, they celebrated the Passover. And it's described there as the best celebration of it since the days of Samuel the prophet. Must have been a great celebration. Remarkable things were happening with Josiah, with Ju the Jewish people, and with their God. A right relationship with the Lord requires a full commitment to him. So the first question, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? You know, I'm not asking, do you know him as your Savior or your Lord? He is who he is. He will be accepted for who he claims to be, not who we might want to make him out to be. Again, once again, we see what he says about himself in his word, and our response is, yes, Lord, I believe. I'll follow you. How's your relationship with the Lord? Are you as close to him as you once were? Do you sense that you've maybe drifted away? Do you need revival? As you sit here today, do you need to return to the Lord? The call is to come to the Lord with a humble heart, crying out to Him to send revival. A humble heart believes we're totally dependent on Him to give us even a hunger for revival. A humble heart understands our tendency to fall away from the Lord. A humble heart believes that God's word has the answers we need. A humble heart listens to those who call us back to God. A humble heart wants to renew a relationship that is right with God. We must not be content to just be a church that preaches and teaches the word and that sees our worship center filled with people. All of those things are good. Don't get me wrong. Those are all great. But is your, humble, is your heart humble before the Lord? Maybe today we need to humble our hearts and cry out to him to revive us. Maybe to revive our church. What's the Lord saying to us today?